So hello everyone, welcome to today's lunch seminar. Um, let's just wait a few more minutes so that more people can join us uh, and, and then we'll start. Just a, a couple more minutes. Hello, Marcos. Hello, can you hear me? Um, yeah, perfectly. So mm -hmm. I, I was saying that we're just gonna wait a, a few more minutes um, so that more people can join us and, and then we'll start. So it's- Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's get started. Hello everyone, once again, welcome to Preverance Lunch Seminar. Um, my name is Ruben and today we have with us Marcos Treviso, who will tell us about his work, The Explanation Game, towards prediction explainability through sparse communication. Uh, Marcos is a PhD student in the Deep Spin Project, supervised by André Martins. His main interests include semi-parametric models and explainability of neural uh, networks. He obtained a master's degree in computer science and computational mathematics at the University of Sao Paulo, having worked with natural language processing and machine learning for sentence segmentation and disfluency detection. Marcus was also a research AI intern at Enbabel in 2018, where he contributed to the project OpenQE. So uh, let's get started. Uh, Marcus, 
Uh, Fine. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. So let's do it. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, yeah. so as you said, uh, I'm Marcos. I did my master's in Brazil at USP. And last year, I moved here to Lisbon to start a PhD position at Technico. I'm happy to be advised by André Martins and co-advised by Mario Figueiredo. And today I present a work that me and André we started last year, in which we define prediction explainability as a communication problem. This is a continuous work that we sent to EMNLP and is still under revision, but let's start. Okay, so these are the topics that you cover in today's presentation. I will start by introducing the reason why explainability is so important nowadays. I will hopefully pass some, uh, some definitions about explainability and introduce related works with a major focus on NLP papers. Then I will draw a link between explainability techniques and classic feature selection methods. Using this link, I will show how we can build an embedded explainability method based on sparse mechanism. Next, I will show the framework in which we define explainability as a communication problem. Then I will show the experiments and my evaluation we did for the MNLP paper. And finally, I will highlight our findings and contributions. So, a critical system is a system which must be highly reliable. For these systems, it's preferable to use older techniques whose weaknesses are understood rather than new techniques which may appear to be better, but problems are unknown. One example of such system is airplanes or air traffic control. Another particular example that is famous for employing top edge technology like deep learning is self-driving cars. Nowadays, self-driving cars can be bought and legally used in some countries. A self-driving car is a vehicle with little or no human input that besides being capable of moving in the environment, it must do it so safely. So one person in question in this case is safety for whom? In an environment like public roads, the algorithm or the artificial intelligence that is controlling the car should take into consideration not only its own safety, but also other vehicles and pedestrians as well. So this algorithm has a bigger responsibility. But according to a paper by Wilson et al. from George Institute of Technology from last year, standard machine learning models that are employed nowadays in self-driving cars have a lower precision to detect people crossing the road if they have dark skin. So it's extremely important to know about this failure case before deploying the model. Here is another example. You might know about this famous case of published by ProPublica. In this case, a machine learning software was used to predict potential criminals. They discovered that individuals with black skin have a higher criminal risk than people with white skin. Even when prior and subsequent offenses tell a completely different story. And there is more. In the US, the criminal justice system is becoming automated. According to an article in the New York Times from 2017, machine learning systems are being applied from the beginning of the investigations up to the sentence and parole stages. I encourage you to read the article and take your own conclusions. But at this point, we may say, okay, cool. These applications are very far away from our responsibility in machine learning or deep learning models work pretty well in practice. So why should I still worry? Well, let's use our imaginations for a moment. Imagine simpler cases, like in military applications with drones carrying sensible stuff, or in a recruiting process where machine learning models can possibly be promoting undesired bias, or in healthcare applications where there are a lot of questions about the responsibility of the decisions and the confidentiality of the patient's data. In fact, there is an interesting case in healthcare where you can see another type of motivation. This is the deep patient case. It comes from a paper published in 2016. In this paper, the authors trained a deep neural network using electronic health records like chest scan. From 700,000 patients to diagnose several diseases like diabetes, cancers, and schizophrenia. At the end of training, the machine learning model was evaluated and they observed a very high accuracy, suppressing even human doctors. So this is awesome, right? Because now we can use a system like this to help doctors in the diagnostic process? Well, kind of. For instance, women doctors find it extremely hard to diagnose schizophrenia in early stages. So how the neural net was able to do that in the first place? It would be amazing if we could investigate its inner workings to get insights on the real problem. 
But despite being state-of-the-art in several tasks, neural nets are essentially black boxes. So another good motivation is how can we inspect the trained model to make it even better? One task that we can see this motivation is object recognition. For example, you might know about these one pixel attack papers where by just changing a single pixel from, a, from the image, the start state-of-the-art neural networks completely change their decisions. Like in saying that a deer is an airplane or that a bird is a frog. Or by just adding small noise to a panda image where the resulting image looks exactly the same as the original one, but for a neural net, it's enough to get a wrong prediction. So if we investigate why this is happening, we can go back and design better models. And here's one example of how we can do this. This is the famous Husky versus Wolf task. Take a look at the pictures and see if you can distinguish Huskies from Wolves. It seems more or less easy, right? The second picture is a Husky and the rest are Wolves. Actually, a neural net was trained for this task and it was able to achieve a very high accuracy, like 90%. But something was wrong. Some very clear images were being misclassified. Here, a case where the neural net got a wrong prediction. Can you spot why? If we employ a prediction explanation method called line, which I'm going to comment about later, we can get an idea of what's happening inside the model. Here is the explanation the line provides for a picture of a husky that was classified as a wolf. It's possible to see that actually the model learned whether there was snow in the picture or not. So, yeah, this is a, this is a very interesting finding. In this case, explanation was given in the form of pixel regions. Well, in this presentation, I will focus on NLP applications. So let me show you some examples of how explanation can be given in the NLP world. One way, is to rank words according to the to importance measure, like what the words affect the classification the most. Another way that is common is to verify the attention weights, which are commonly employed in NLP. Here, the weights associated with words are usually an indicative of their importance. Like in this hotel review, where words like service, excellence, cleaned, location, price, were highlighted, indicating that the, low, the model was focusing on these words during the prediction. Attention mechanisms are also very commonly used in neural machine translation. In this task, we can use the attention weights to investigate whether the model was focusing during a particular moment in the generation of the translation. So, in this example, if we check the attention weights for a unknown token, in the target language, we discovered that it was aligned with the token seek to seek in the source language. And although we can have other kinds of explanations in NLP, we will talk about explanations as rationales. A rationale can be defined as a short yet sufficient part of the input text, or more simply snippets that support the output. For example, in this beer review, the model predicted the look of the beer as five stars. Therefore, a possible explanation is because it has a very pleasant ruby red amber color. And the same can be applied to other tests like natural language inference. Okay, so I've been talking about uh, showing you some explanations, some filler cases, but let's situate ourselves in the world of explainability for a moment. This work is contained in the explainable AI world, which is part of the more broader trustable AI area, which also covers topics like validation, privacy, fairness, and many more. It's a topic of growing importance and that is receiving a lot of new ideas and definitions every year. So it's very hard to write a single and precise definition of each of those terms. Okay, so you may ask, what is trustable AI? What is explainability? What is interpretability? What is the difference between them? And does it matter to whom we are trying to explain? Should we explain the model or the decision for a particular input? And these are all valid questions. And there is actually a large body of work on analysis and interpretations of neural nets. I suggest you to read, if you are interested in this area, I suggest you to read these works in the AAAI tutorial on explainable AI to see 
the right definitions for, for this stuff. Let me show you the works that are very related to our work. This work is, this work I present today was evaluated on NLP tasks. So I will show you some works that contextualize this work. One of these works is the Attention is Not Explanation paper by Jane and Wallace. In this work, they compare attention weights with gradient measures, concluding that they are uncorrelated and that by inducing a different set of attention weights, we can have equivalent predictions. Another work in the same line is the Is Attention Interpretable by Stefano and Smith. In this work, they performed an attention ablation study looking for decision shifts by zeroing out or in the normalizing attention weights. They observed that by zeroing out the, high, the highest attention weights didn't impact much the model's decision. And that we need to zero out a large set of attention weights in order to flip the model's decisions. With this, both authors conclude that as an important, as an importance measure, attention weights fail to explain the model decisions. Enters in the next paper. The attention is not not explanation by Wigraf and Pinter, which questioned the conclusions of the previous papers. One of these counterpoints was the idea of plausible and faithful explanations. They conclude that attention weights can be plausible with explanations, but they are not always faithful. And what is plausible or faithful? In this line of work, the work of Jacob and Goldberg gives a more simple definition of plausible and faithful explanations. They say that plausible explanations are related to how convincing the interpretation is to humans, and that faithful is related to how accurately it ref the explanations reflects the true reasoning process that led to the model's decisions. They also say that the idea of faithful explanations might actually be impossible without taking causality into account. And finally, they propose a graded notion of faithfulness, where instead of having a binary notion of, of that is faithful or not faithful, we have a notion of, okay, this is more faithful than that. And one line of work that is arguably generates more faithful explanations is what we call the rationalizer models. In these rationalizer models, we pass our input, our text, through the rational extractor, and only the rational part is passed to the classifier, which in turn makes a prediction. The idea is that since the classifier only sees the rational, its decision must be based only in that snippet of the input. So more formally, we have a classifier parameterized by theta that must predict an output y, giving it as input x masked by a binary latent variable z. In to generate this latent variable mask Z, we use a different model, the rational extractor G, which is parameterized by a different set of weights. To generate this mask, it generates each ZY independently from some distribution, like a Bernoulli distribution or from a hard Kuma distribution. The idea here is that a value of Z equal to one means that you are selecting the input, whereas a value of zero means that you are ignoring it. So this is like hard attention, right? The disadvantage of these methods is that they are perhaps harder to train due to the need of calculating gradients of stochastic computation graphs. They are trained to minimize the classification loss, like the, like the log loss, for instance, and also some penalties, like a term encouraging sparsity and a fuse lasso penalty encouraging contiguous rationales. A more recent work added the notion of that is important for this work as well. And it, was, it was introduced by the young et al. this year. It's the notion of comprehensive and sufficient rationales. In a few words, you say that comprehensive rationales have all necessary information in order to make a decision, while sufficient rationales have just the enough information to make a decision. But okay, with these definitions, let's go back a little bit back in time and review what we used to do in classical feature selection. We can find a similar structure to the way we find explanations for a particular decision with the way we do classical feature selection. In classical feature selection, 
the selection happens statically at runtime, such that after training, relevant features are permanently deleted from the model. So I have my features, I pass them through the model, then I delete features that I deem to be not important. But for prediction explainability, the selection happens dynamically at runtime, where a feature that is not relevant for a particular input can be relevant for, relevant for another. So you pass my input, these are the relevant features, but for another input, I can have a different set of relevant features. So we can link static and dynamic selection using a typology from classical feature selection proposed by Guillon and Elise. A typology consists of wrappers, which, which lists the learning machine of interest as a black box to score subsets of variable according to their predictive power. An example of this is forward selection. Or filters, where we device to include or exclude a feature based on an importance metric defined a priori, like arise mutual information. And embedded methods, where feature selection is embedded in the learning algorithm by using a sparse regularizer like the L1 norm. With this in mind, we can find dynamic selection methods that is explainable, uh, explainability methods that fit in this typology. Okay, so for wrapper methods in the dynamic world, we can have a representation erasure, a leveling out strategy, or perturbation methods like line. In the filter methods, we can have like methods based on the gradient, like input gradient, and top k attention methods. For embedded methods, in the dynamic world, we can have the rationalizer models, which use stochastic attention, and we can also have models with sparse attention, which can be seen as the counterpart of L1 regularization in the static world. In fact, sparse attention is something that was not applied before to extract operationals, and this is a novelty of this work. So I'll dig a little deep on, on this sparse attention. Let me do first do a very quick recap about attention mechanisms. In general, we have this abstraction of carry keys and values. The idea is that we want to compute scores between the carry vector and each key vector, resulting in a score for each key. The next step then is to map these scores to probabilities. One way of doing this, the common choice is to choose a softmax transformation, which due to its entropy regularizer, the softmax transformation is dense, putting mass on every single token. And therefore, it leads to less faithful explanations. And moreover, since it's not selecting anything, we don't have an embedded method. And we have to filter its output somehow, like doing top k or selecting only the values above a predefined threshold. Another choice is to choose sparse max, which projects the scores onto the probability simplex using an Euclidean projection. Sparse max is, leads to sparse distribution, which is more faithful. Also, since it completely ignores some inputs, it is in fact an embedded method. But can we have something between softmax and sparse max? And the answer is yes. This is the offhand max transformation proposed by the Peters et al. They generalize both softmax and sparse max. In the alpha and max transformation, we had the entropy regularizer parameterized by alpha. The idea here is the alpha controls the amount of sparsity in the transformation. For instance, if you set the alpha equals to one, we have softmax. If you set the alpha equals to two, we recover sparse max. If you set the alpha to a value higher than two, you get more sparsity. Okay, so now we have all the, the ingredients to build the communication framework. Our assumption is that explainability is linked to the ability of an explainer to communicate the rationale of a decision in terms that can be understood by a human. We use the success of this communication as a criterion for how plausible the explanation is. This is inspired on the idea of a human rather than evaluation through forward prediction simulation proposed by Doshi Velis and King. Let me show you more formally what this means. More formally, then we have a classifier which produces predictions y hat, which are hopefully close to the true y. And we assume that the classifier can also produce some hidden representations. The need for these hidden representations will be clear later. 
the explainer receives this y hat and produces explanations for this y hat based on the input x, the classifier's prediction y hat, and possibly on some hidden representations h. These explanations can be regarded as a rationale for the classifier's decision. Finally, the third model is the layperson, which receives the message and based only on this message produces a final prediction. If the layperson's prediction is the same as the classifier's prediction, then the communication was successful. Ideally, the layperson is a simple interpretable model, like a linear classifier. Note also that the layperson, since it receives only the message, it's also a more faithful classifier. Okay, so in short, in the blue box here, the classifier produces white hats, the explainer explains white hats by producing a message M. The message M is passed to the layperson that uses it to predict Y tilde. And with this, we define the communication success rates or CSR for short, as the fraction of examples in your training, in your data set, for which the communication was successful. Under this framework, we regard the CSR, the CSR as a measure of explainability. So a high CSR means that the layperson is able to replicate the classifier decisions a large fraction of the time. And this certifies that the explainer's messages are informative enough. If we relate our framework with classical feature selection typology, we can say that for filtered and wrappers, the classifier and the explainer are separate components in our framework. And the explainer works as a post hoc explainer, just accessing the classifier. For embedded methods, we can see that the explainer is actually included as an internal component of the classifier. This is the case of the rationalizer in the sparse attention models. One thing to notice here is the flexibility of this framework. For instance, any, any message space M can be used to create messages. And this is also valid for the explainer. Any kind of explainer can be used in this configuration since they can be independent and independent from the classifier. So let me show you some examples of messages in explainers. Example of messages for NOP are of course rationales which I talked about which can be encoded using, for instance, bag of words or word embeddings. Or you can have other type of messages like prototypes or criticism to explain a decision. And so on, you can have influence functions or Shapley values and other, other kind of methods. So for explainers, uh, I divided here in wrappers, filters, and embedded following the, the previous topology. So we can define a large number of explanation methods to serve as an explainer in a framework. One such example is LIME. So LIME is a perturbation method. It works by adding noise to the input we want to explain, looking for the most discriminant features locally, according to shifts in the decision. Other popular method in NLP is the leave one out method. It works by simply removing just a single word from the sentence and passing it to the classifier. At the end, we select the words that most impact the decision as explanation. For example, if you have the sentence, why this move is so bad, we start by sending the original sentence to the classifier after which we get a prediction probability. If we do this for, then we remove one word like the first word and pass the edited sentence to the classifier, we get a new prediction probability. If we do this for every word, for the second, the third, and so on, till the last one, we get a, a prediction probability for each word, for each token. After this, after we have the, done this for all tokens, we can select the removed words that impact the most the classifier's decision as explanation. Another method that commonly used in the literature is the erasure method, which is very similar to the leave on out strategy. It starts by sending the original sentence to the classifier and getting a prediction. After this, we consider some measure like gradient magnitudes or attention weights. And after we have these scores, we zero out the word associated with the highest measure score, for instance, bad. Then we pass this edited, edited sentence 
again back to the classifier. We do the same process and we get our scores and we remove the, the word with the highest score. After we do this for K steps, we can create a message of, of K words. Some other popular choices, which are also included in previous work, is the gradient based in topic A attention methods. This case works very similar to the previous ones. But instead of erasing one word after calculating the measures, we sort the, me the measures and get the top keywords as explanation. So in this case, we'll select Y, bed, and the interrogation point as explanation if we set K equals to three. And finally, the embedded methods of stochastic attention and sparse attention are very similar to the filter methods that I showed before. With the important difference that in this case, we don't have to rely on some post-processing technique to select the important words. In this case, words associated with zero probabilities are completely ignored and the other ones are selected as explanation. So in this work, we use erasure, gradient, topic K attention, stochastic attention and sparse attention as explainers. We also did experiments using human explainers for one data set. I will show later in the human evaluation how, how this was done. Okay, so, um, so, so far in our framework, we have two types of explainers. We have an explainer that carries the classifier multiple times, or we have an explainer that is embedded in the classifier. But in both cases, only the layperson is a trainable model. That is, we don't have the power of training an explainer to communicate. And this is where enters our next idea. We let both the layperson and the explainer be trained jointly to maximize the success of the communication. We do this by letting the explainer and the layperson play a cooperative game. More formally, let the explainer have a set of trainable parameters, theta, and the layperson have a different set of parameters. As before, the input for the explainer is a tuple containing x, y hat, impossible hidden representations h. But now we have a gradient flowing during backpropagation from the layperson to the explainer, giving the explainer the, capaci the capability of changing its, its explanations in order to maximize the communication. Also, now we have a combination of two losses. The construction term loss, which is just a declassification loss, in another term that promotes faithfulness. For this, we try to approximate the classifiers, hidden representations H, with predictions of these hidden representations made by the explainer. In this way, we try to make the explainer also learn how the original classifier engineered its decisions. Note, however, that this idea has a potential flaw. Potential flaw. We are passing the classifier prediction y hat as input to the explainer, which uses it to produce a message m. And based on the m in the message m, we try to predict y hat back. In this way, the explainer and the lame person could agree on a trivial protocol and easily maximize the communication. Let me show what the trivial protocol looks. It, will, it works like this. Suppose they have a particular input like, why this movie is so bad? The model could select the, the word, only the word this as explanation and send it as a message. And every time the lay person sees the word this, it generates a negative prediction. On the other hand, the explainer could, could learn to select some common word like the word A, and it would send this as a message, and the lay person would always predict a positive label after seeing the word A in the message. So in order to forbid this trivial protocol, we propose two heuristics. One, in the, first, in the obvious one, is to forbid stop words from being selected by the explainer. The other one is to pass the classifier's prediction I had as input to the the explain to the explainer only for a small fraction of the examples according to a maximum probability beta. In practice, we set beta to 20%, 20 
in we increase it linear during training such that at the end of training it is it has exactly 20 percent chance of accessing those y hats so basically this is it this is the communication framework so let me show you now the experiments that we did we evaluated this framework on six data sets including text classification natural language inference and machine translation data sets but in this presentation, I will focus only on two data sets, IMDB and SNLI. I can say that the results for the other data sets are basically the same. Here is our setup, which is very simple. The classifier is composed of an embedding layer followed by a BiLSTM, an attention layer, and finally a linear output. We define the message as bag of words. And the layperson is just a simple linear model. So here are the classifiers results. We have a total of five classifiers. So we have a, a bag of words uh, baseline and uh, attention neuro, recurrent neural nets with attention classifiers using softmax, intmax, and sparse max. And we have two rationalizer models, one using Bernoulli attention and the other one using Hardikuma attention. We can see from these plots that all classifiers achieved a reasonably high accuracy. The attention-based ones all perform very similarly and hopefully better than the rationalizer models on IMDB, but slightly worse on SNLI. So let's see the communication results in terms of CSR. Here, we evaluated a random explainer, which just selects world words hand only as explanation. Erasure explainer, which is a wrapper method. Topic K, Topic K gradient, Topic K attention methods, which are filter methods. And selective attention in the rationalizer models. Note the difference between the selective attention and Topic K attention. In the Topic K attention, we perform like Topic, uh, perform like sparse max attention. And after that, we do Topic K. In the selective case, we only apply sparse max and we select only words with non-zero probability. Okay, the first thing that we can notice here is, as expected, the random baseline does much worse than the other explainers on IMDb. On SNLI, it, it was able to achieve a reasonably high score, probably because on SNLI, just by looking at the hypothesis, is already a strong baseline. We can also see that attention and erasure methods outperform top K gradient. This suggests that the words that have a higher local impact on the classification are not necessarily the most informative ones. Now, looking at the accuracy of the lay person, we can see that between different attention models, like softmax, antimax, and sparsemax, sparse transformations tend to have slightly better accuracy. We can also see that embedded methods achieve scores on par with top K attention methods without the need of a prescribed K while producing by construction more faithful explanations. Inside the embedded methods in general, the sparse attention methods in max and sparse max seems more accurate than the rationalizer models with the advantage of having a much simpler training procedure. One thing to notice in these experiments was the fact that topic K attention methods performed really well. One reason for this is because we tuned the K on the validation set. That is, we tuned the number of words that were being selected to be in the message. So next I will show the trade-off between the length of the message and the communication success rate for different values of K. So in this experiment, we tried values of K of one, three, five, and 10 for IMDB, and zero, one, two, and four for SNLI. The values of K for the embedded sparse max in antmax models are determined dynamically during training, which are 13 and 28 on IMDB, and eight and 13 on SNLI. We can see that for both data sets, as K increases, the CSR starts by increasing 
but then after some point it starts dropping when k becomes too large. This matches our intuition. In the two extreme cases where k is equal to zero and k is equal to 15 here, which corresponds to the document length, corresponding then to a full bag of words classifier, that is we are not selecting any word at all, we're selecting our words. The message has no information about how the classifier behaves. So in general, we can see that the CSR does not increase monotonically with K. And these findings for text classification natural language interests are also the same for machine translation. We can see this monotonic behavior and we can also see that gradient measures, which are the gray here, gray line, seem to be less informative than attention ones. Okay, so next, the, the final experiment of our work was the human evaluation, where we used humans both as a lay person to verify if the generated explanations are informative for humans and as I, an explainer. In this experiment, we include the joint trainable model, which maximizes the communication as well. For the human lay person model, we selected 200 examples from IMDb in SNLI. We shuffle those explanations and display them as a cloud of words to human annotators, who had to predict the label of the document only by seeing the limited information. For the human explainer model, we use the ESNLI corpus, which includes highlights over premise words marked by humans. For this explainer, since the explanation is for the true label and not for a predicted label, we have that CSR is always equal to the accuracy of the lay person. Okay, so let me show you the results that we got. Here are the results for IMDB. A K column means the message length. CSRH represents the CSR obtained by humans. CSRL is the CSR obtained by the linear model. And the same is the same meaning for the accuracy. The first thing that we can see in this table is that, as expected, the joint explainer achieved a very high CSR, surpassing all other explainers. And this shows that the potential of this, of this communication framework to develop new post hoc explainers with good forward simulation properties. Next, we can also see that erasure and attention models achieve better results than top K gradient in terms of CSR in accuracy, reinforcing again the same finding from the previous experiments. Among the embedded methods, we can see that the human performance for the Bernoulli, Bernoulli rationalizer was lower than the other explainers. And this is probably because, because of the length of the message, which were very large for Bernoulli. So when we shuffle a lot of, lot of explanation words, the human get confused. For SNLI, we can see that the joint explainer was not able to achieve high human scores. And that even human accuracy, in the, even the human accuracy for the human explainer, human highlights, was not the highest one, indicating, indicating that for this task, a more sophisticated type of explanation should be considered and not just selecting words. In fact, one thing that we can notice here is that for SNLI, large messages usually return higher human accuracy. So here are the larger messages, which will return large human accuracy. Indicating in this case that comprehensive rationales might be more relevant than sufficient ones. Okay, so in this work, we propose a unified framework that regards explainability as a communication problem. This framework is very flexible, where we can choose several different configurations for the explainer, for the classifier, and for the layperson. We also draw a link between classical feature selection and explainability methods. And following this link, we propose an embedded method based on selective sparse attention. And we also took advantage of this flexibility to propose a new explainer method that is trained to optimize the CSR. Our results indicate that attention and erasure methods tend to get a higher communication success 
hit the gradient-based methods, and that embedded selective attention is effective without the need of tuning the message length, without the need to put in that K parameter, which indicates the number of words that are selected to be in the message. And also, they are much simpler to train than rationalizers. These are the reference of this presentation. And that's it. thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marcus, for, for this interesting and very relevant presentation. Uh, we now have uh, time for some questions. If you want to ask any questions, um, you can go to the participants menu on the bottom and click the raise hand button that appears on the bottom right. Uh, if you raise your hands, I will then allow you to unmute your microphone. So you'll see kind of a pop-up window um, saying that you, you can unmute uh, your microphone and then you can ask your questions. Uh, you can also ask questions through the, the chat. Um, so in the meantime, Marcus, uh, I have a question. Uh, could you please uh, tell me, tell us a bit more about the loss function that you used? So um, in your loss function, you have to take into account the, the matching between the gold and the, the model predictions, and also a component that tries to match the model predictions with the layperson predictions, right? You are saying this one for the joint, joint explainer? Yes. Uh, so could you, could you give uh, another overview over that, please? Yes. So the loss for the joint explainer is based on two losses. One, on two terms, right? One is the reconstruction term, which is right. basically we are trying to, is the layperson loss, if you will, is the classification loss. Mm. Which based on the message, we try to predict the y hat, the right. prediction of the classifier. In a faithfulness term, where we try to approximate, so it's a square loss, the hidden representations from the classifier in, mm -hmm. in this H bar here, which are predictions made by the explainer of those hidden representations. Right. So we are trying to predict what were those representations that the classifier exposed. And hopefully in this way, you are, we're we're making the explainer learn how the classifier engineer its decisions. Right. Uh, did you try other architectures for the, the layperson or, or for the, the explainer? So for the explainer, we tried uh, several explainers, right? Uh, but in this case, for the joint explainer, it's right. basically an architecture that is equal to the classifier. So it's a RNN with attention. Okay. And no, I didn't try a different one. It's basically a name okay. extension. And for the layperson, we just tried a simple linear model, simple logistic regression model. Okay. Thank you, Marcus. Um, You're welcome. So are there any other questions? Okay, so um, once again, thank you for your presentation, Marcus. Very interesting. You're welcome. Um, before leaving, let me just alert you that there will be a special lunch seminar next Wednesday at 2.30 mm -hmm. p.m., uh, a different time, uh, with Professor Laura Bolzano from the University of Michigan. And she will tell us about her work, preference modeling with context-dependent salient features. So yes. uh, don't forget, next Wednesday, 2.30 p.m., it's a bit different from the usual schedule. So this is it for today. Thank you for coming. And I hope to see you all next week at a different time. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you, okay. Mark, again. Bye. Bye.